Hello everyone, this video is going to take you on a tour of the fetal circulatory system and then outline the transition to extra uterine life. Let's go. The adult circulatory system is a series circuit. The right heart pumps blood to the lungs, which where gas exchange takes place. It returns to the left heart, which pumps it to the body and then returns it to the right heart. The fetal circulation is parallel. Both the left and right ventricles primarily supply blood to the systemic circulation. Gas exchange and nutrient exchange only take place with the placenta via the umbilical vessels. I'm only going to cover usual anatomy. While congenital heart disease is important and fascinating, it is such a huge topic it would have been impractical to include in this video. We'll start our tour arbitrarily at the right ventricle. Because both ventricles contribute to the circulation in parallel, it is more useful to describe circulation in terms of combined cardiac output. That is the cardiac output of the left plus right ventricle. The normal combined cardiac output for a fetus near term is 450 to 500 mils per minute per kilogram body weight, and the right ventricle produces about 60% of this. The oxygen saturation in right ventricular blood is 50 to 55%, lower than typical mixed venous blood in an adult, which is 60 to 75%. Like usual, it exits via the pulmonary valve and pulmonary artery. One of the most important differences in the feces is that the pulmonary circulation has relatively high resistance. This is due to the, and likely the main purpose of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction as well as the immaturity of the pulmonary vasculature. For comparison, in adults, the systemic vascular resistance, or SVR, is about eight times higher than the pulmonary vascular resistance, or PVR. In the feces, the PVR is three to five times higher than the SVR. The SVR is also lower due to the low resistance placenta being com connected to the systemic circulation in parallel, which we'll see shortly. As a result, at term, the lungs only receive about 18% of the combined cardiac output. You might see some sources say 7 or 8%, but most of those figures are from LAM studies. The rest of the right ventricular output is shunted through the ductus arteriosus into the aorta, just after the arch. The ductus arteriosus is one of three important shunts in the fetal circulation. There's still some blood coming from the arch, about 10% of the combined cardiac output, which adds to the 40% coming from the ductus arteriosus to give about 50% going to the lower body. The arch blood bumps the saturation up to about 60%, which is still profoundly hypoxemic by postnatal standards, but in combination with fetal polycythemia manages to maintain adequate oxygen delivery to the developing lower limbs and viscera. Heading down into the lower body, the aorta gives off the renal, mesenteric, and hepatic arteries as usual, though I haven't shown them for reasons of clarity. Likewise, the lower limbs and pelvis are perfused via the iliac arteries and drained via the iliac veins into the IVC. The umbilical arteries branch from the internal iliac arteries and carry about 35% of the combined cardiac output. This is more than the preductal fraction that supplies the whole upper body, and uses about 70% of the flow through the descending aorta. This is where that hypoxic blood becomes advantageous as it creates a larger gradient for placental gas exchange. The primary function of the placenta is the transport of substances between the fetal and maternal circulation, though it also has important endocrine, barrier, and immuno immunological functions. It is composed of fetal-derived cells and tissues that interface with the uterine blood vessels and specialized endo endometria, endometrium known as the decidua. From the fetal side, we see the major functional unit of the placenta, the tree-like chorionic villi. These vascular structures branch out from the umbilical circulation to maximize surface area. The uterus is perfused by bilateral ascending uterine arteries, which anastomose superiorly with the ovarian arteries. They supply regular arcuate arteries that encompass the uterus like lines of latitude within the outer myometrium. 
The arcuate arteries supply radial arteries towards the endometrial surface, which supply about 80 to 100 spiral arteries that pour fresh maternal blood into a vast swirling lake that fills the intervillous space. The blood washes around the chorionic villi before being drained into uterine veins with an overall flow rate nearly twice of that of the fetal circulation through the umbilical vessels in the placenta. The placental venules and veins drain into a single umbilical vein. While this is the most oxygenated blood in the fetal circulation, it has a hemoglobin saturation of only 75 to 85%. Once it enters the fetal body, it diverges superiorly from the umbilical arteries. To understand the anatomy of the umbilical vein, it might be easier to work backward from the adult hepatic circulation. In both adult and a fetus, the spleen and gastrointestinal tract are supplied by abdominal aortic branches and drained into a common hepatic portal vein, shown here. On reaching the liver, the portal vein branches into left and right portal veins, and then further into segmental branches and ultimately supply individual hepatic lobes, along with the accompanying branches of the hepatic artery and biliary vessels. The umbilical vein connects onto the left branch of the portal vein as it starts to diverge within the liver. This means that blood from the umbilical vein would still have to flow through other branches and sinusoids of the hepatic circulation before it reaches the hepatic veins that drain into the IVC and the general circulation. The ductus venosus is one of the three special shunts in the fetal circulation, though it's probably the least important one. Its role is to divert some of this oxygenated umbilical vein blood directly into the proximal IVC, bypassing the liver. By term, the fraction of blood from the umbilical vein that's diverted through the ductus venosus decreases from at least 30% to about 20%, though it does increase in response to fetal hypoxia. The liver itself doesn't extract too much oxygen, so blood draining through the left and, and to a lesser extent the middle hepatic veins is still relatively well oxygenated. The right side of the liver only receives about half of its venous supply from the umbilical vein, and the rest from the portal vein. In the, so the blood in the right hepatic vein is more hypoxic. About 80% of the liver's blood supply is supplied from the umbilical vein, with 15% 15 from the portal vein and 5% from the hepatic artery in the fetus. Now this is one of the most interesting parts of the fetal circulation. The blood arriving at the right atrium, which represents 80% roughly of the combined cardiac output, doesn't have time to fully mix together. This means that you have different streams ranging from maximally oxygenated umbilical vein blood via the ductus venosus, through varying degrees of oxygenation from the hepatic veins, to the least oxygenated blood from the rest of the IVC, SVC, and coronary sinus. The foramen ovale is the last of three shunts in the fetal circulation and functions as a window in the atrial septum that allows blood to pass directly to the left atrium from the right, bypassing the right ventricle and pulmonary circulation. Purely through evolutionary fluid dynamics, a significant proportion of the higher oxygen blood from the ductus venosus and left hepatic vein is preferentially streamed through the foramen ovale into the left atrium, leaving less oxygenated blood to fill the right ventricle. These preferential flow patterns are known as the via sinistra and via dextra, which are Latin for left path and right path respectively. The right to left flow across the foramen is about 24% of the combined cardiac output. So even with some deoxygenated blood from the pulmonary veins, the blood filling the left ventricle is significantly more oxygenated, about 65%, than blood filling the right, which is 55%, as mentioned earlier. This ensures that the slightly more oxygenated blood 
is reserved for the heart and brain before the remainder mixes with the blood from the ductus arteriosus to supply the body and umbilical the rest of the body and the umbilical arteries. To summarize so far, the lungs are not oxygenated so have a high resistance. The systemic circulation has placental circulation in parallel so is relatively low resistance. The left and right ventricle both direct most of their output into the systemic circulation with the aid of the ductus arteriosus. The systemic and pulmonary mean arterial pressures are generally in the low to mid uh, 40 millimeters of mercury range and the combined ventricular output is 450 to 500 mils per minute per kilo or about 1.5 to 2 liters per minute a term. The right atrium receives just over 80% of the output as systemic venous return versus nearly 20% for the left. So another 25% is shunted right to left. So even though the right ventricle pumps a little more blood, even so the right ventricle pumps a little more blood than the left due to the extra preload. Now let's see what happens to the neonates immediately after birth. The most important transitional event is the first breath. Air enters the alveoli and the pulmonary circulation is exposed to atmospheric oxygen. The remaining fluid is absorbed into the pulmonary circulation and lymphatics. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction reverses and the pulmonary vascular resistance falls by five to ten fold. The left atrium receives a surge of oxygenated blood. A combination of the newfound chemical energy and the spike in catecholamines causes the ventricular output to effectively double, with each ventricle now outputting the previous combined flow, which is transitioning from parallel to series. After delivery, the umbilical arteries constrict in response to low temperatures and high oxygen. The uterus contracts, pushing blood back to the fetus, and the umbilical vein collapses. The cord is typically clamped and severed at this point. The loss of the placental circulation causes a fall in venous return to the right atrium and an increase in systemic vascular resistance. The rise in left atrial pressure and fall in right atrial pressure cause presses the septum primum against the septum secundum, functionally closing the foramen ovale. With the fall in preload and PVR, the mean pulmonary artery pressure falls to less than half its previous value, around 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury in the neonate, while mean systemic pressure rises slightly to around 48 millimeters of mercury. This causes the ductus arteriosus to reverse flow, becoming a left to right shunt. Exposure to oxygen-rich blood and loss of placental prostaglandin E2 leads to vasoconstriction and functional closure of the ductus arteriosus, typically within the first 12 to 15 hours after birth and almost universally in the term infants by four days. This process can be inhibited by administration of prostaglandin E1, which also triggers vasodilation via EP4 receptors. This can be vital in certain duct-dependent congenital heart lesions. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs accelerate closure by inhibiting prostaglandins. Anatomical closure can um, take two to three months. Meanwhile, the ductus venosus collapses within minutes due to loss of umbilical venous flow and anatomical closure is usually complete within one to two weeks, becoming a ligament like the ductus arteriosus. If you want more information, as always, check out Deranged Physiology. The most comprehensive textbook I've found is this one. It's a massive two volume set with a ton of useful information. My other favorite text is this one. It has more of an embryology focus and it's probably more student oriented with great diagrams. For maternal and neonatal physiology, you have these two. The former breaks things down by phase and patient, while the latter goes system by system for both patients. There's also this comprehensive look at the placenta and a couple more clinical texts. Fetal cardiology had a, a lot of good hemodynamic information, including for the placental circulation. And finally, if you want to dive into reading about congenital heart lesions, I found this truly comprehensive textbook from India, which I would highly recommend. I have no conflicts of interest, I just like, like books. I'll also post a link to a few journal articles in the description. Thanks for watching and sorry if the audio is a bit worse than normal, I'm moving house at the moment. If you found it useful, please like, share and comment. 
I have a playlist of videos on other medical science topics. I also made a short video about how I animate these presentations in Microsoft PowerPoint, so check that out if you're interested. If you want to stay informed of the next video, please subscribe to my channel. Until then, bye.